This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, now it's time for one of the highlights of our symposium every year is our Binkley Lecture. And uh, this year we're really thrilled and excited to again be able to welcome the current president of the Society for Vascular Surgery to our meeting. Dr. Peter Lawrence is a good friend and colleague from UCLA. Many of you know him well and personally because he's, he's close to here and, and uh, we see quite a lot of him. Peter has had a long and distinguished career in vascular surgery and has made many contributions throughout his career. Surgical education is a big one, and he shared with us yesterday at UCSF some great observations on the use of simulators, not only for endovascular repair uh, or interventions, but for open surgery. Peter actually graduated from Harvard Medical School, so he started in Boston, which is a criteria I have for inviting people. Um, all kidding aside, uh, he, he migrated west early in his career, uh, really uh, put in a tremendous effort launching uh, a great program at Utah where he was there for more than a decade and then moved to California, was actually a vice dean at UC Irvine before going to UCLA where he's been the chief of vascular surgery now since I think 2003. Peter has been president of our Western Vascular Society, Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery and uh, after uh, doing a tremendous job at the SVS uh, in terms of program committee for many years and many other uh, many other things within the society was appropriately named our president this year and he's done an amazing job uh, in a tough job uh, and Peter we're really thrilled to have you be with us these couple of days with a very busy schedule and his Binkley topic is aortic graft infection the contemporary management of a resurgent problem please welcome Dr. Peter Lawrence. Well thanks very much uh, Mike and Chris and all of you participated and put together this uh, outstanding meeting. It's a pleasure to be back and uh, talk about a topic that I've had a longstanding interest in and uh, hopefully it's one that uh, you uh, either have an interest in or if not can recognize and uh, get the individuals who, who do. This has been said to, uh, this, this topic of aortic graft infection has been said to make more professors of surgery and kill more surgeons than almost anything in history. So uh, this is a complex problem and one that I think we're finding is a resurgent problem. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, aortic graft infections, uh, what I think are the optimal uh, approaches and, and the variation in approaches and also some of the national data on uh, the evolution. Uh, this is a, uh, a meta-analysis that Mark Sarfati did a couple of years ago and published in Bruce Gewertz's textbook on surgery of the aorta. And I think you can appreciate from this that, uh, first of all, in looking at a large series, this is the real world uh, data that uh, the incidence still remains low, but by the number of aortic Gra uh, graphs that are placed either with an endo or open approach, that it still is a significant problem. Uh, there are probably about 2,000 of these per year. Uh, this data is a couple years old and endographs have been put in more frequently. Uh, and it probably underestimates the true frequency uh, of the problem. Uh, what's disturbing is the uh, the one-year one survival, the mortality remains high, as Dr. Eichler uh, told you, and I'll be, uh, it's nice that he gave uh, his approach to this uh, complex problem, particularly the, the infection part of his talk. Uh, it has a low survival because these are older patients, they're high-risk patients, uh, but even uh, if the patients survive, there's a significant morbidity, significant risk of limb loss, uh, and uh, also reinfection of the graft. The thing that uh, has really changed, and this is a, 
just a, a diagram that Jim Stanley gave me, but from one of his textbook chapters, as you look at the evolution of management uh, of aortic uh, grafts that are placed for several different uh, type, for any almost any type of problem, and you see these errors and changes uh, since the uh, since the 1960s and uh, 50s when the first grafts were placed, and each time that there's been an advance, and that would include uh, not only the aortofemoral graft and learning to use perioperative antibiotics, but vascular surgeons almost exclusively doing the procedures. But at then, then at the end, and even though this chapter was written a few years ago, it wasn't in 95, but I think he, this was actually published in uh, 2008, but he predicted that there was going to be an upsurge in the number of graft infections uh, with endografts, and that's exactly what's happened. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh, uh, particularly focus on endograft infection, which I think is the new uh, epidemic that we'll be dealing with. Even though the incidence of graft infection with endografts is uh, lower than it is with open repair, the number that are placed leads to a significant number of patients in reports there have been 35 papers in the literature uh, related to endograft infection. Most of them have been, have been case reports, but recently uh, there have been several uh, series, and uh, at the SVS annual meeting this year, we're going to be presenting what I think is the largest experience with aortic endograft infection. Now, I'm just going to go through briefly the, the approach to patients that I think most of us use. Uh, first of all, these often uh, present in the groin, but not exclusively. Uh, when they do, their methods of getting cultures because the absence of incorporation and the presence of infection and, and documentation of the bacteria becomes absolutely critical. Uh, it, lack of incorporation is the gold standard. Uh, many of these cannot be cultured because they're uh, indolent organisms like Staph epidermidis, but uh, with special techniques and uh, sonication, it's possible in the majority of patients to at least identify the organism. The uh, diagnosis in aortic graft infection as opposed to lower extremity graft infection where it's often obvious clinically and you'll see pointing in the groin or in the leg in the, a in the abdominal aorta, it's a much more difficult diagnosis and consequently many of these patients get much sicker before they eventually uh, develop their, uh, their, before the diagnosis is made. And there's a characteristic appearance with you saw it in Dr. Eichler's uh, uh, presentation and also in, in uh, this one where there's perigraph fluid and often air uh, as uh, the sine qua non for uh, a graft infection. We do a CT uh, aortogram, and so we get both the imaging for anatomy and the flow and the proximal and distal vessels as well as d uh, helping to diagnose the presence of infection. But there are some patients who don't have perigraph air and don't have perigraph fluid, and then we have to move on to other diagnostic studies. I just would mention that for some patients, uh, uh, endoscopy becomes a critical uh, part of the, di of the diagnosis, and uh, Linda Riley, who's sitting in the office, has educated us on the importance of endoscopy, and I remember a paper she gave at the SVS meeting at a breakfast session about uh, how... Uh, how important it was to do endoscopy, but how many patients with aortic grafts have GI bleeding from another cause. So it's not only diagnosing the graft infection, which occasionally can be done by seeing the graft using push endoscopy through the duodenum, but also identifying other causes of, of GI bleeding. And in fact, uh, graft enteric fistulas are only 1% of patients who are GI bleeders. So uh, it's a worthwhile technique to do in stable patients, uh, and sometimes it makes a diagnosis, but more importantly, it excludes other causes of GI bleeding. Now, as I mentioned, we use MR angi or we use CT angiography because we use the CT scan to diagnose the infection, and then the CTA uh, to, to diagnose and to uh, identify the anatomy. It's absolutely crucial in these patients that we know anatomically where the proximal anastomosis is, whether it's end to end or end to side, whether there are any side branches, and this is, allows for much better planning. This is just an old-fashioned angiogram showing a pseudoaneurysm, and rarely do we actually do angiography. Most patients we can have either a CTA or MRA to help us, but we, our preference is for a CTA to use in, in planning in these patients. 
Now, there are some patients who have such indolent organisms or where they have other sites of infection that, uh, that it can't be diagnosed by MRA, CTA, or direct exploration. And so in those patients, an indium leukocyte scan has been the gold standard. Uh, we've been using this probably for over 20 years. And uh, recently, I was just talking to David Saloner, who gave a talk earlier and is an old friend about uh, you know, PET and spec scans. And in, at least in Europe and in England, they're increasingly being used for both looking at the risk of rupture of aortic aneurysms, but also for graft infection. And I think that eventually, that may be uh, the gold standard. But currently, uh, indium leukocyte scans, as you know, where you take some blood, label it with indium-111, and then re-inject it in the patient and look uh, for where the uh, activity occurs. The problem is that these are, are not 3D. They're AP, and they're, so they're only two plain projections. But these are a couple patients that uh, we documented in a paper in the Journal of Vascular Surgery a number of years ago. But the principles are the same. Not only uh, was it pretty good as far as, as, uh, as identifying infection, but also in patients who didn't have infection. Uh, the other thing that was very helpful for is occasionally we had patients with other sources of infection, spinal osteo a myelitis, uh, a lung infection, some other source of the patient's fever, elevated white count. They may also have the, a graft infection, but it's very helpful in looking for other sites of infection that you might not pick up clinically and particularly might not see on a CT scan. So I think that the indium leukocyte scans are very useful in that subgroup of patients where it's not obvious on the CT scan. Now, this is a typical patient and uh, one that, uh, that I took care of a, a few years ago, a lady that came to see me, and it's a classic story. She's a patient who had horrible rheumatoid arthritis. As I remember, she'd had multiple joints replaced and prosthetics and had been on steroids, and she had an aortofemoral bypass that had been performed about 10 years prior to, uh, to the, when we saw her. Uh, and immediately post-op, she developed a problem in her groin. It was hard to tell exactly what it was, but she seemed to have some bleeding uh, a few days post-op or a few weeks post-op. They did a flap, so it makes me think that she had an infection there or some concern about it. But she did well for a number of years, continuing to get immunosuppression for her rheumatoid arthritis until she presented to us. And you can see in the photo there the picture of the left groin where she was pointing and had an abscess in her left groin. And this is the typical patient. I think you can see both uh, the fact that she uh, has, you can see her graft, you can see her extensive aortic disease and extensive calcified iliac disease. So a real challenge as to how to manage this patient. And I'll tell you a little bit later about how, what her outcome is. But um, so that's the typical patient. Now, several years ago, uh, Bob Rutherford had asked me to look into, for one of the seminars in vascular surgery, uh, one of their uh, uh, one of their sections to, to write about minimally invasive approaches. And I must say, I had sort of a nihilistic approach toward, I didn't really believe that these minimally invasive approaches work, but I was forced to review the literature. And I was amazed at how much literature there is and how much uh, you know, positive writing there is about the approach, the minimally invasive approach. And that means simply IV or, typic or topical antibiotics, muscle flaps, which Keith Caligaro has popularized, but even uh, treating patients simply with drainage with antibiotics and then long-term oral antibiotics. And I've always been skeptical about this approach, but there are patients who are such high risk that they will survive with this. And in fact, I was on a panel uh, a few months ago with Martin Molina, who some of you may know uh, who, from uh, Sweden, and Martin said that they no longer operate on any patient with an aortic graft infection. 100% of their patients are, are put on antibiotics and antibiotic suppression, and he believes that the long-term mortality is lower with that approach than, than getting into a more aggressive approach of removing grafts and bypassing patients. I asked him what he would do with a 55-year-old patient who is otherwise healthy, and, and you know I think that he probably might modify it. But his point is that so many of these patients are elderly, high risk, that the operative mortality exceeds the advantage over simply putting patients on antibiotics. I just mentioned that not because that's the gold standard, but because there are people who use a very minimally invasive approach to even to aortic graft infections. 
Now, one option is simply to take out the graft and patch the, this is a patient who, a diagram patient who had an endocyte anastomosis from proximal aorta and, and uh, has had the graft removed. And uh, surprisingly, in one series, about 10% of patients, or 15%, uh, 15 out of 101 patients in one series did not require revascularization for aortic graft infection. I think virtually all of these patients had a proximal endocyte anastomosis, but the point is that revascularization is not always necessary. And so part of the issue is figuring out with the patient, did you initially have claudication or rest pain? And then looking at the operative note, what kind of proximal anastomosis, what the distal anastomosis was. And there are patients where you can simply remove the graft and patch the aorta and they'll return to their preoperative state, but that may be one simply of claudication. Uh, a few years ago, we reported in the Texas uh, uh, Heart Journal uh, a, uh, an approach to patients who had groin infections where they were either had pointed and exposed or were easy to expose where we uh, took a limb that was infected and simply anticoagulated the patient, clamped the limb. Uh, for a period of time, usually 30, 40 minutes, and measured non-invasively what their perfusion was in their lower extremity. And if they got no symptoms in their foot, if their ABI remained high and they had the limb clamped, then we thought that it might be safe to remove that, uh, which I think is a better option uh, in patients who don't require the graft than to try to place a graft either extra anatomically or in situ for that group of patients. Now, the gold standard for management of patients, as you heard from Dr. Eichler this morning, the gold standard is a graft excision and extra anatomic bypass. And uh, it, when we look at the overall results of this, of po something popularized by a former giant in, in this, uh, in the department at uh, UCSF, Bill Blaisdell, for other purposes, but in, it really developed that technique uh, of extra anatomic bypass and reported it first. Uh, it, it is the gold standard, uh, but it is a big operation, uh, and it's associated with, in many of the, the large series, with a mortality that's up to 40 percent. I know that you've reported here on a lower mortality, but that's in uh, patients who are uh, probably uh, better managed because you have such a huge experience. But anyway, it has a 40% a mortality and 25% amputation rate in most of the series. Now, Linda Riley, as I mentioned, uh, presented or had a paper published in 1987 showing that it was safe to revascularize first, do an extra anatomic bypass to make sure you get good perfusion to the lower extremities, not simply remove the infected graft and do the extra anatomic bypass, but stage it, and that there was a very low risk of infection of the extra anatomic bypass. And in many places that do the gold standard of this com combined procedure will now stage it in one to two days after the initial procedure, and I think that's a very reasonable approach. It rests the surgical team, the patients do better, and I think it's probably a best way to get them through this. The other options are to do uh, extra anatomic bypasses, and I mentioned the axfem fem fem uh, for unilateral uh, limb infection. Uh, you have to make sure that it doesn't involve the body of the aortic graft, and that's one of the great challenges. If you know that you're excising only the infected graft and leaving uninfected behind, then I think it's a safe procedure, but it's very hard to tell where that proximal right angle clamp is, whether that's infected or not, and reinfection rate is considerable in these patients. But it can be done in uh, patients who have isolated single limb aortofemoral graft infections. Doug Jika, who uh, uh, reported in 1996 on a, using autogenous tissue, and uh, although this reduced the infection rate, the revision rate was significant, and I think that uh, it's a trade off between immediate treatment of the infection and the requirement to re. re, to re vascularize some of these patients a second time when their infection is, is, uh, is treated. Now, if we move to the, uh, what I think are going to be considered more contemporary approaches, just based on our review of the literature and in that recent paper that we'll be publishing in 
presenting at the uh, annual meeting, uh, it was, has been proposed for a long time that you should just simply take out the infected graft and place an in situ another graft exactly in the same site. And uh, there have been a number of papers on this. This is just one that was a relatively large series. And uh, they pointed out it wasn't appropriate when there was significant suture line involvement, that there was a risk of recurrent infection, and that it was most appropriate for patients who had uh, normal host defenses. They also talked about the use of uh, antibiotic bonding of Dacron as a better way to, with rifampin rather than, uh, and soaked on the back table, rather than uh, pl placing a prosthetic graft that hadn't been protected with any antibiotics. Well, most of you know that Pat Claggett made his career and actually had a huge, huge referral practice, which I think exists even to this day, although Pat is re retired, uh, of at Southwestern of, as an alternative using all autogenous tissue. And his approach is to use both femoral veins uh, if it's needed for an aortobifemoral graft. If you can get away with a single vein because it only needs a unilateral bypass, that can be done. And he reported a, what's called the NACE procedure uh, for the neo-aortoiliac system. And uh, this is a combination of uh, autogenous vein harvested from the leg. You might think that edema is a big problem, but in most of the series it occurs in a significant but not a huge percentage of patients after their femoral vein is removed, but splicing it together on the back table and creating a bifurcated neo-aorta. And not only Claggett, but others who have, have adopted the approach have shown that this works pretty well, that there's a low reinfection rate. Surprisingly, there's a low aneurysm and graft blowout rate, uh, and that patients uh, do quite well. The main challenge here is that it's a, it's a big, long operation. So in many of the series and many of the institutions that use this, they have two teams, and the average operating time can be six to eight hours at the minimum, and often 10 to 12 hours to do this procedure. So it works well, and uh, there are many options for the way that it's constructed and the way that the bifurcation graft is, is developed. But the point is that even though that's the case, that uh, this is a big operation and one where you need to do it enough to be comfortable with the approach. Now, the other alternative is to use an allograft, and this is uh, Edward Kiefer, uh, who first reported this, uh, and his experience from France, uh, where he worked, and he had patients who had both cryopreserved and also fresh allograft. And although he reported very good initial results, as you can see here, in a fairly large number of patients, I think he had almost 180 patients in his own personal series, that the main issue was one of the long-term outcome, that he had a few patients uh, who developed, who died due to allograft rupture, either aneurysm or reinfection of the allograft. So the concern was it was great in, in, as a short-term temporary replacement, but the big risk was that patients uh, occasionally had graft complications. And that led to a lack of enthusiasm for that. In the United States, cryopreservation of these same uh, allografts has been performed by, there are several companies now that do it, and you can either have a cryopreserved vein or artery, and the artery can come with branches. You can have the visceral vessels, which can be used for side branches, uh, and this is, uh, uh, a, I think, a significant option, and one that uh, should be considered uh, using either cryovein or cryoartery in patients with, uh, in, for inline replacement. There are some advantages, to, I think, the artery over vein. It's thicker. You get side branches which are already made and it fits anatomically for aortic graft infection. And Audra Duncan, in a paper that she published in 2003 with a small registry that she had of allografts, showed uh, you know, how the advantages of cryo or artery versus cryo vein. And these are just some diagrams that we have of different approaches. As you can see, you can rotate the graft and use.
use a celiac as a, a, with a beveled proximal anastomosis for renal revascularization. So there, and you can do it with a, uh, either in line or you can do it as a bypass in the abdomen and then later take out the graft or take out the prosthetic graft at the same time. So there are a lot of options with a cryo artery and many people have adopted this approach. As Dr. Eichler said, the key is to getting proximal uh, and distal exposure and aortic control. It can be done with a balloon, uh, but I think most would prefer to have a clamp on the aorta proximal uh, to any uh, infected graft prior to removing it. But there are a number of uh, options for proximal and distal control. This is a big, high-risk operation, and I think institutions that, that really are interested in graft infection uh, can do this well, but it is a big operation, and uh, it needs to be very well planned. This is an example of an infected uh, endograft and what it looks like when it comes out. Probably not too surprising to those of you who have encountered this. Uh, so we, when I moved to UCLA in 2003, I discovered that several people within our group had already moved to using cryovein and then cryo artery became available and I had never used this. I had either done the extra anatomic approach or uh, used a rifampin soaked graft and I was very impressed in watching them uh, get excellent results with an in situ uh, approach. So began to use that and happened that since I was the new kid on the block, got to probably five or six patients referred within a short period of time, started using the cryo aorto iliac and we decided to report our experience and to look at uh, our 22 patients that we did over that period of time. Uh, that led to us having an interest in combining forces because we realized that 22 patients wasn't enough to get much experience. So we uh, have a, a system of, of doing collaborative research with other institutions. Many of you may have participated in one of our projects, but where you have a standardized database and it's like doing a research project at one institution, but you do it the same way at all simultaneously. And we reported on the use of the cryopreserved aortoiliac allograft. And here we had 220 patients, so the largest series of infected uh, aortic uh, grafts from 14 institutions. And you can see here the distribution. Only 5% of the patients had endografts, so it wasn't a good representation of that group of patients. But what we learned from this uh, was not only that many people were using this inline approach, but how they approached it and what they did. And the key is that to reduce the risk of reinfection, that you need to have full excision of the graft. You can't leave a part of it in place in the majority of them. 60% uh, uh, of patients had the full graft excised when it was infected, and these are just where the proximal and distal anastomoses were done. This is the, just a, an operative report on one of our patients just showing, showing you how it looks after it's been placed. These are n completely normal aortas, so they're very different from the patient's uh, native vessel, and there's a lot of options as far as how this is configured. What was impressive to us was the, the low early and late complication rate. We had patients followed with a mean of 30 months, but with a big range, and as you can see, there were very few complications. There are, there are complications, but compared with national series, there was a, a, a relatively low complication rate, and if you look in that graph that freedom from complications, it's, it's uh, you know, a significant percentage of patients do very well with a cryopreserved approach. And if you look at what the key factors are related to complications, the patients who don't do as well are the older patients, uh, those with very virulent organisms, and those who have pre-existing arterial occlusive disease. They, they seem to be the major factor. Then we looked at how many patients had to have those cryo uh, aortoiliac implants, how, how many of them had to have them removed. And here you can see that the durability was quite good. There's an occasional patient who had a recurrent infection. There were a couple that had aneurysms, but that was relatively low, and the large majority of patients did extremely well. If we looked at the factors, again, associated with the need to remove them, we found that age, again, was an issue. The, uh, but the complete removal or versus partial removal, if you don't take out the entire infected graft, you are going to have a high likelihood of recurrence and the need to eventually 
remove that, uh, that cryo uh, aorta iliac graft. When we looked at patient survival and uh, graft patency, as you can see, this is a high-risk group of older patients, so their survival is not good. But if we look at what, why they didn't survive, it has very little to do with the graft itself. So we, these are patients where you could get through an operation, they're gonna die often of other diseases, but in fact, the large majority of these patients had patent grafts and had a cure of their infection, or if not a cure, at least they were living with their infection. Now the, the issue of the endograft, which I'm gonna finish with, is, is one that has come up uh, recently, and, and uh, as we have, have tended to be able to, if not cure, at least reduce dramatically the number of patients who uh, have a, the standard aortic graft infection. The number of infected endografts has increased significantly. Here's just a picture of not only the CT scan with the perigraft fluid and air, but also the appearance of that graft. And here you can see, uh, as I mentioned, the value of an indium label leukocyte because many of these patients, they are, because they've had an endovascular approach, uh, they often aren't identified by their primary care physician or referring physicians until they've, they're very sick, but this is an obviously infected uh, aortic endograft. Uh, Audra Duncan, who is collaborating with us on this multi-institutional study, she reported on their experience at the Midwest Vascular, and as you can see, there were the majority of their patients uh, where they were not all treated with, uh, uh, with the cryo, but this was her early experience uh, that they reported uh, using both uh, insight to prosthetic graft, uh, antibiotic so prosthetic graft, uh, cryo vein and cryo artery, and you can see that distribution. This is just the appearance of one of the uh, endografts that was uh, with the frank purulence, which is what you often see uh, before they remove the graft. And here's a patient who had an aorta enteric fistula, and you can see the, the, the bile staining from that, uh, as well as the, this uh, very inflamed, complex, deep infection, which makes it a technical challenge to remove uh, these endografts. This is an example of one of the patients that, uh, that was in the series, a uh, patient with an infected aortic endograft who got recurrent UTIs with a salmonella infection, psoas abscess, and eventually an infected graft. And this is what he looked like after he had drainage, uh, had a temporary axillofemoral bypass, and then eventually had a cryo, uh, a, had the endograft removed and an in situ cryo graft. Well, I just want to finish by saying that uh, uh, at the SVS meeting, I can't present the paper, but it's been accepted and it will be on the aortic section. And uh, this is the, by, going to be by far the largest series, 202 patients with infected endografts, uh, the majority of them EVAR, but a few of them TVAR. And you can see a typical patient there, uh, what their management was. And here, what uh, surprised me a bit was that there were very few patients treated only with antibiotics, uh, but that the majority of patients were treated with inline reconstruction. And this is the survival of that group of patients, and I, you'll be hearing more about that at the meeting. So in summary, uh, our options are to preserve the graft and use a very conservative approach, to use an extra anatomic bypass, which is the gold standard, or do in situ reconstruction. And our impression is at this point that replacement of infected uh, prosthetic grafts with autogenous inline cryopreserved aortoiliac grafts is probably the best option for the majority of the patients. There certainly are other options, but for us, that's the one we believe is associated with the highest long-term survival and cure of their graft infection. Thanks very much for your attention. That was a great uh, talk on a topic that's always of great interest and I know it's been of interest to many here in the audience. So we have a few minutes for questions and comments for, for Peter. Dr. Lee. Do, do you think that survival will be better for the, for the 
for the stent graft infections because they probably didn't have the open juxtarenal exposure and stuff. And did you find, I mean, we probably have to wait for Chicago to see yeah, that. Yeah, I can't I, tell you all that, but I can, the thing that, that impressed us was how much sicker the patients get because nobody tends to diagnose it and it's a closed space infection. And so what happens, these patients get a lot of pus, there's tremendous inflammation. So I think that the, the operative procedure may actually be tougher, but the actual outcome long term uh, will probably be better. So, um, not speaking for Linda Riley, but both myself and Linda had a sort of a catastrophic case with cryovane uh, in a recent past where uh, we put them in an infected fields and they had blowouts. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes we bring them back to the upper room several times. I think eventually both patients expired. I was wondering if you had any comments on that and if you are continuing to use cryovane in the infected fields uh, or with gross contamination. Yeah, so uh, important issue of how many, so as you could see in that large number of patients, there were only about four patients that had blowout, but that did occur. And the worst actors, I think, are very aggressive. So I'd be curious as to whether you had a gram-negative organism. I think for Staph epi and some of the less, the more indolent organisms that the, that the risk is lower. Uh, one of the things that people have talked about is in those very aggressive organisms, doing an axe fem and doing an extra anatomic, but then you've got an aortic stump, which has a, a, also a risk of blowout. So I'm not sure that you're protected if you don't put in the, the cryo aortoiliac. The other thing I'd be curious is that you'd use aortoiliac vein or artery, uh, because artery, I think, is more resistant. It's thicker. And then sometimes what we've done is we have actually put a drain in and either actively drained it or even used an irrigation system in those very aggressive organisms. You're not going to avoid blowouts. You're not going to avoid limbs going down. But I think the incidence is low, except in those very aggressive organisms. And then you've got to have some alternative adjuncts, which to us will be drains, antibiotic irrigation, as well as putting in the cryo aortoiliac. All right, that's, that's terrific, and thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for that talk.